let's get started. Well, thank you so much for coming to this special seminar. It's actually indeed a special seminar. It's actually a it's actually a pleasure to have Dr. Harinder Makar here with us. He has, I was actually telling you, he does have a very long CV. And uh, it actually took me more than one hour to go through his CV. And I'm not really sure if I capture everything I should. But I'll just give you a brief on uh, Dr. Makar. He does, he works at uh, FAO since 2010 in uh, animal production. Uh, office of FAO, the Food of uh, Administration, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. He was a uh, professor at uh, Mercado, professor at the University of Hohenheim in Germany uh, before joining FAO. He has published more than 300 research papers and has more than 16,000 citations. He does have an age index above 60. This is an accomplishment by itself. He's worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, Austria, for seven years. He's been awarded honorary professorship by the University in China, Mongolia, and a fellow of the Commonwealth Association in the UK uh, and Germany, and a, a Humboldt Foundation in Germany, and by the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science. He's an advisory, he's on advisory boards of very different projects funded by uh, the AU and USAID <coughs> and has taken part as an advisor and evaluator of the work conducted by a number of national and international organizations. I don't really have to tell you much, but he does travel a lot. <laughs> um, so it's really a pleasure to have you here, Harinder. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much, Louis, for, for the kind words. And it's an honor and pleasure to be here. Um, well, I will be speaking on food feed competition in the efficiency diagram. This presentation has a bit of international flavor. So sitting here, you might be going to different countries because there are a lot of information from different countries uh, which we have gathered. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start with uh, uh, changing livestock landscapes. What has been, say, changes which occurred in the last 10 years in the livestock sector and how FAO sees where it will proceed in the future. Some global feed scenarios and challenges how to address those challenges in terms of some novel feed resources which we think would emerge in the future, <laughs> future feed resources. And the <coughs> emphasis of FA has always been that we would promote those feed resources which do not compete with human food. So that has been the focus of our work. And then move on to efficiency dilemma. People try to measure efficiency, they are different units, and one can come to different conclusions based on what units they choose. And then some scenario building, we did some study. Uh, if we follow that path, how the future looks like in 2050, and then some take home messages. Okay, this is the statement made by former Director General of uh, FAO, Dr. Diof. He made this statement in 2007, and this says that over the next 50 years, the world's farmers and ranchers will be called upon to produce more food <coughs> than has been produced in the past 10,000 years, and to do so in an environmentally sustainable manner. And what was in his mind when he made this statement, I think this line shows it very clearly. And if you look at the global population, world population, 2000 BC to almost 1800, there was not much change in the population, the world population. 1850, it was around 1 billion. 
and in one century from 1850 to 1950, so 1.6 billion people were added, and in the ongoing century, 1950 to 2050, we will be having 9.6 billion means additional 7 billion people in this particular <coughs> ongoing century, which is 1950 as the base. So <coughs> a large number of mouths which we need to feed, I think we can feed them, but the challenge would be how to feed in a sustainable manner. And of course, different people have different <coughs> perspectives of sustainability, and I think I will not touch upon that today, but we have been extensively working in FAO, what do we mean by sustainability in a holistic manner. So the so-called livestock revolution started in 1990s, and from 1990 to 2010, <coughs> egg production at a global level increased by approximately 80%, meat 60% and milk 30%. And most of this increase originated from developing countries. And also if you look into the future, up to 2050, this blue line is for the 12th world and this pink line is for the developing countries. <coughs> Here, this is more or less flat not much change in the coming years in the 12th <coughs> world, but in the developing countries. So all, most of the increase, almost 90% of the increase in animal products will originate from developing countries. So the center of gravity as far as production of animal products is concerned, it is shifting towards south. So there will be more opportunities in the south in terms of production, growth for the livestock industry. Poultry sector increased at a very high rate. The growth has been very high, followed by pigs and then the ruminants. But if we look at the to total meat production in the world, <coughs> pig is at highest and then poultry and then the ruminants. So the growth is taking place in the poultry sector, but currently the total amount of meat produced is highest for the big sector. And the ruminants are lying behind. <coughs> this slide shows protein production as million tons in different regions of the world. North America, Latin America and Caribbean, Western Europe, almost similar, 9, 9.5, 9.6. Here lies the problem, very low in sub-Saharan Africa. East and Southeast Asia, quite good. Driven by China's pork industry and India's milk production. India is the largest producer of milk and the growth of the pig sector is very high in China. In fact, China is driving in terms of feed use and milk production. So South Asia dominates as far as growth in milk production is concerned. Again, as I, as I mentioned, led by India. <coughs> and Sub-Saharan Africa is at the bottom. And meat production, the growth is highest in East and Southeast Asia led by China and Vietnam. And Sub-Saharan Africa again lagging behind. There's a very good relation between the income of the people, GDP, and amount of animal products they consume. So as the, uh, more money comes into the pocket of people, they tend to shift their diet from vegetable protein or vegetables or cereal proteins to animal proteins. And this is a very nice graph which shows a very good relationship between per capita GDP and per capita animal protein supply and consumption. So what does it mean? 
for the field industry, for the fields. That there will be huge demand for field. The field will be a big challenge in the future. And we need to ask ourselves from where the field will come. From 2015 to 2015, we will need additional 40% cereal for the livestock feeding and oil seed cakes almost 60%. According to FEO's estimate, uh, maize production additional, I think, will be 443 million tons of maize from now onwards, and almost 60% of that maize will go to the livestock feeding, 23% to biofuel production, only 17% will be left for human consumption. So we will see a big food feed competition in the future. This slide illustrates very nicely the, this issue of food feed competition. Currently, at a global level, one third of the total cereals are being fed to animals. And of the total cereal used in the livestock sector, 34% are used for feeding to pigs, 26% each to poultry and dairy animals, and D14%. And if you look at this portion of the slide, European Union uses 53% of the cereal produced for livestock feeding, USA 65%, Brazil 40%, China 33%, India around 6%. And according to this study from another UN organization, UNEP, that the cereal energy used for meat production, if fed directly, that it can meet the energy requirement of half the population. It's a very good illustration how <coughs> food feed competition is a serious issue and will be becoming further a serious issue in the future. Another aspect of feed fuel competition, almost 6% of the total global grain production goes for biofuel production. Approximately 143 million tons of cereals go for biofuel production, 292 million tons of sugarcane, small amount of cassava goes for biofuel production. These are the two big issues when we talk about fuel feed competition. And also, for if you look at sugarcane, it's, it's a food as well. So this is a study done by FAO. And according to this study, if the biofuel production continues at the same rate as has been continuing in 2008 or 9, luckily it has decreased now. The rate has gone down of biofuel production. But this study was conducted in 2000, 2009 that if it continues at the same rate, then the undernourished preschool children in Africa and South Asia will be 3 to 1.7 million higher than otherwise. So we will see a big impact of biofuel production on <coughs> nutrient deficiencies in the world. So yeah, these are the challenges. So what are the solutions? How do we see that the future will shape up in order to decrease food, fuel, and fuel competition? So what are some options? One <coughs> option is, is, is the use of all products of the biofuel industry. And one very good example as well as US beef industry is concerned. U.S. beef industry has very well adapted to using distress grains. 143 million tons of grains go towards biofuel production. And if you look in the stoichiometry of ethanol production from maize, the stoichiometry is one third of mass goes towards ethanol, one third distress grains, and one third CO2 in the environment. So this is the stoichiometry. So it means that one third of this means almost 47.5 million tons of distiller grains are produced by the biofuel industry, which is a very good feat 
although it's, it's high in phosphorus and has got some challenges in terms of uh, balancing the ration as well as phosphorus is concerned. But this is a very good feat. And in the US, if you look into the typical type of beef animals 10 years and now, you would see that soybean has gone down, maize has gone down, and distress things have gone up. So US beef industry has adapted very well to this new field source which came approximately 10, 12 years back. But it is not so the case in other parts of the world. Europe has not adapted very well. European countries certainly not. So this is a feed resource which I think should be considered seriously by other countries. Now if you look into the biodiesel production, biodiesel is produced from oil. And this is a transesterification process. There are different steps. In the last step of transesterification, when biodiesel is produced, 10% of that stoichiometrically is glycerol, which is a very good energy source. So this could be used in the animal diet, and there are many publications <coughs> on that, showing the importance of glycerol for feeding to livestock. But again, it has not become a mainstream feed for the feed industry. So feed industry has to change its mindset to use glycerol as an energy source. Experimentally, it is well proven that up to 10% of the glycerol there is no atmosphere. But if you add more than 10%, then the diarrhea comes in and there are other challenges. And at the first stage of transesterification, fatty acid distillates are produced, which are also very good energy source, which could be also used for the plant of Okay, this palm kernel cake, pongamia seed cake, grape seed cake, sunflower cake, camelina seed, and green forests. Of course, these are used for ruminant feeding, but most of the demand is coming from more or less exactly from the protein sources. So how to make use of these for feeding to monoplastics? They have a lot of fiber, monoplastics do not like it, productivity will go down. So one of the options could be to prepare protein isolate from these. 80 to 90 percent of that material is protein and could be added to the monogastic diet. So something which is human edible, inedible, used extensively in the ruminant sector, but if we go in that direction of producing uh, protein isolate, these would also be used for the monogastic industry in the future. Also, there's a great move to move towards green chemistry. So use of organic solvents for extraction of oil uh, is not considered to be environmental friendly. So the move is to use enzymes, cocktail of enzymes, aqueous <coughs> medium, to extract oil from various oil seeds. The quality of the oil is good, and in the process, because photolytic proteases and carbohydrates are being used to extract oil to break the cell wall, in the process, we get hydrolyzed proteins, peptides, amino acids. The acidity of that is very high when we talk about monogastic nutrition. So this could be another field resource for the future, that in the process of oil extraction, we get high quality oil, and at the same time, hydrolyzed protein uh, for feeding to monogastics. Sea beets. <coughs> Red algae, green algae have very high protein level and could be used for livestock feeding. Some of these algae are rich in bioactive compounds. They can positively influence gut microbial ecology to increase productivity and having less of health issues. Source of organic minerals. They are cartridge and minerals from the sea sources could be used in the organic farming. There are a couple of studies now, just about two, three months back, there was a study that some of the seaweeds have got bioactive compounds which reduce entire methane. At a very low level, if you add as an additive, it would decrease methane emission from the human. So this is another field which is coming up very fast. Uh, I think we need to look at it very critically how we can exploit seaweeds for various applications. I'm 
sure you must have heard of your trophy about this Mexico is just beside your uh, city. Uh, your trophy, ninety-nine percent of the trophy in the world is toxic, but there is a non-toxic genotype also which is present in Mexico. But the germ class has now spread to almost all countries in, in the tropical world. And I think this climate would also be quite suitable for your trophy. But of course, uh, we have extensively worked on the toxic one identified, the toxic component, uh, detoxified, and there's a patent as well. But we are trying to promote non toxic because you don't have to go through all these detoxification processes. It doesn't have any, any toxic. So the toxic in this is four molester. And we have done a lot of studies on lamb, fish, showing that non toxic genotype is safe for. And long term studies have been done. So, this is another future field resource, and I have a feeling that uh, this environment, this climate is also uh, here in this uh, state, would be suitable for this non toxic This is caster meat, is, is another important feed resource when we talk about India and Brazil, they produce a lot of castor. But it, it, is, it is toxic. And if you scan the literature, detoxification has been tried at the lab scale. It works very well at the lab scale. Feeding studies have been done, but the need is really to upscale it to the industrial level and study its economic viability. So another very good feed resource when we talk about tropical world, especially India and Brazil, who produce a lot of castor. Currently, it's used as well. It goes into the soil. Camelina setava is a temperate plant. Grows in, in uh, temperate climate. Very good protein con content. Very good amino acid composition. Essential amino acid composition, lysate and amino acids is quite high. Uh, Russia is, is going ahead quite a lot with Camelina. Lupin widely grown in Europe, being a temperate. But still, it has not really penetrated very well into the industry. Although the European Union is deficient of protein resources, they import 70% of the protein from outside. Only 30% of the protein for the livestock industry in the EU is made locally. Very good protein source, especially European Union. They, they are thinking of, of uh, extending the plantation of humans. <coughs> but it's not very good in essential amino acids. So you have to add synthetic amino acids to the animal diet. This is for temperate region. There, there are a number of agro processing byproducts. Examples being of the reverse grain from the beer industry, baby corn plant apple pomace, citrus pulp, I don't know, somebody from India here. This is sag based spinach and uh, uh, we eat a lot of sag and there's a lot of byproducts waste coming out. So these are some of the agro-industrial byproducts proven to be quite safe. You will find publications, animal studies, <laughs> but the challenge is how to make them mainstream feeds. So that industry incorporates them into the regular feeding, make them feeding, piloting, and all those things. So these, these are the challenges which we have to address, especially with the feed industry. Scientifically, I think all the challenges have been met in terms of uh, studies, animal studies, but somehow it has to penetrate into the feed industry, which is not yet taking place. So how much is available? Very little information. Because industry would like to know, yeah, it's a very good feed resource. Please tell me how much you can supply, how much you can get it. This information is not missed, it's not, not available. Most involved in transport would be a big issue for the industry because they have a lot of moisture in it. Then you try it at the site, or if we bring it to the factory, how to address that? in terms of transport, that would be a big challenge. But these are some of the field resources which I think can be exploited and they do not compete with human food. 
this is again uh, at FAO level we are promoting very heavily in the tropical group. This is Moringa olifera. This slide is from Nicaragua. And under intensive production systems, it can produce a dry matter yield of 126 tons, which is huge. Dry matter. You can take cutting every 40 days. But it, under intensive production system, the protein content uh, is all almost in the leaf meal, it's around 25%. And if you look at the whole plant, you cut the whole plant, stems and twigs, and the leaf is around 70%. So the protein yield per hectare is 21.4 tons per hectare. Very, very high yield of protein. Sugars are also very high. Starch content is very high. And if we compare this yield with soya bean, soya bean, you can get 3.5 tons per hectare. 35% is the protein. So the total protein yield is almost 1.2 tons per hectare for soya bean. And here I have tried to compare it with leaf meal. This is minus twigs, minus stems, only the leaf meal, which is 20% of the whole plant, and if you take 20% of this, multiplied by 25% of the protein, it comes to 6.4. So this is, an, and of course you will ask, what is the protein quality? Yeah, quantity is very high, five times higher, but what's the quality of this protein? Amino acid composition, if you compare Moringa protein and soya bean, Exactly similar. Essential amino acid, everything, very good protein quality. In terms of digestibility, both around 80 to 85 percent, 90 percent. So, digestibility of moringa protein is very high. Amino acid composition, essential amino acid composition is very, very good. So, and the protein yield per hectare is very high. So, this could another be a very good field resource, but it's a tropical plant. It would not grow in Insect meat is coming off very fast. Black soldier fly, larva, maggots, which are larvae of the house fly, they contain almost 50% protein. Fat content is variable, it depends on what substrate you use to rear the insect. If the substrate is rich in fat, the insect will assimilate insect. Fat. So the protein content relatively remains quite constant. 45 to 55 percent, but fat content varies depending on the substrate. So another very good feed source challenge currently is to produce at industrial scale. So this is the challenge really to upscale the process. Currently, uh, this insect meat is they are allowed to be added into the bird and the pet foods, but they are not allowed currently for the food producing. Uh, European Food Safety Authority has authorized that these insect meals could be used for aquaculture. As of 1st July, they would start looking at case by case basis how they are producing insect meal and they will give permission for using it to aquaculture. Not yet for poultry, slowly and slowly it will come for poultry. <coughs> and just last week, the uh, Canadian Food Safety Authority has given permission to use insect meal for aquaculture. I think FDA will follow. So another future feed resource uh, for uh, fish, poultry, and pig. And the quality is very, very good. Amino acid composition is very good. And uh, the study shows that almost 50% of the soil you can replace by insect meal without having any adverse on the product. So we have a publication on that from FAO. Another Unconventional feed resource, especially thorn less cactus, pithia, widely used in Brazil, Mexico, West and feed. It does not have any thorns. Under Brazilian condition, you can produce 200 to 260 tons of biomass per hectare. It was 90% of this is water, so it's around 20 tons of dry mass you can produce per hectare. Per hectare. And under Tunisian conditions, as LA farming, mixed farming, this is barley. Barley plus cactus, it has not adversely impacted the yield of barley and gave additionally uh, cactus, which can be used as feed. Cactus is low in nitrogen, so one has to add a bit of nitrogen to that. 
otherwise a very good source of energy. It is used uh, in Brazil. On a diet containing 70% of this cactus and 30% of normal concentrate can maintain a cow giving almost 25 liters of milk. Right? No, just 30% of concentrate and rest of this. And in the small world productions, this is from Tunisia. Uh, the ladies they cut into pieces and then feed the sheep and goat. And cactus is a mud, is, is of course, uh, another thing is that the water footprint is very, very low. 50 liters per kg, whereas for cereals it varies from 1,000 to 3,000 liters per kg of cereal produce. So very low water footprint. Uh, and you can in fact build an industry around thornless cactus because each and every part of this plant has one or another use. Uh, fruits for human consumption, I'm sure you must have seen in the market cactus fruits for human consumption. Uh, yeah. You can use, uh, you can prepare marmalade, jams, shampoos. It has got a number of uh, medicinal properties. There are some publications showing <coughs> that cactus flavors, if you consume a salad, it can decrease the cholesterol level and and also a hypoglycemic effect. So medicinal properties and, and this, this slide is from Chile. Chile is I think, leading as far as multi uses of cactus. Brazil is very good in using the cladors for feeding, but not that good in using exporting other parts, other uses. Chile is, is, is quite ahead of that. Uh, this plant is through, F we have got FAO ICARDA network, and through that, the germ plus is now going to China, Morocco, all these uh, dry areas where cactus has got its own. Advantages because of the water shortage. So this is another feed source for future, especially for dry areas. Now I come to another uh, aspect of food waste. We waste 1.3 to 1.6 gigaton of food in a year, which is almost 30 percent of what we produce, with a carbon footprint of 3.3 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gas per year. Huge, what we waste. It has a water footprint of three times the Lake Geneva, which extends from Switzerland to Germany. And 1.5 billion hectares of land is used to produce that food to be based. And if you look into the socio-economic cost, economic cost of all that which we waste the food, it runs in trillions of dollars. Of course, the first thing has to be to reduce the waste. But there are also <coughs> ways to make, to bring that food waste into the food chain by converting it to animal feed. And there are very good examples in the world. Japan is recycling almost 36% of the food waste animal feed. South Korea is recycling 43%. Of, of the food waste. So there are examples which we could follow. How do, how, do they, how do they address the safety issues? How they, do they do all this uh, collection and converting it to animal feed? So th there are good examples which other countries could follow. And these are some of the studies which we did using this food waste to rear insects. And these can be used for livestock feeding. And you can directly convert to silage or to block and use that for animal feeding. So we, we have got uh, documents which uh, give the test procedure, a recipe book, how you can convert these food waste to silage or use them for insect training. This is a scenario from India and China. Almost 26% of the straw is burnt in India and 37% I think is in China. So huge amount of wheat straw is burnt. It's a valuable feed resource. If you look in from the point of view of the developing world, almost 50 to 60% of the diet of an animal, for dairy animal, say in India, or in uh, Indonesia, or Bangladesh, is wheat straw. Although in, in uh, US traditions you use these straws just as a bedding, but in developing countries, 50 to 60% of diet is wheat straw. 
So the challenge is really to come up with good harvesting techniques that collect it. And now we have some machines which could collect this straw very effectively, efficiently from the field. And the processes have been developed to convert that straw into a complete feed. Complete feed, you mix that straw with oil seed cakes, urea, molasses, energy sources, vitamins, minerals, and press them to form a block or you can add it. So the technology is available. <laughs> Extensively used in India, but not being used in the adjoining country in Bangladesh or Pakistan. So as an FAO, we are trying to strengthen the South South link that the technology from one country, from say India, could be transferred from Bangladesh to Pakistan and other countries. So this is how we work under South South cooperation, where if one country is strong in one aspect, we help them to transfer to other countries. Again, it's something which is which you can't eat, and you can prepare sort of candy or a block or so. There's a less wastage, easy to transport, high productivity of the animals. And in the developing world, it's the women who feed the livestock, who take care of the livestock. And, and a large part of the time, women's time go for feeding the livestock, preparing the feed clean. And if you could give these blocks ready made and tell her to feed this much if your animal is feeding five liters of milk, you feed this much, if you ten liters, if you feed this much, that saves her time. And that is empowerment of women because that the woman can use that safe time for taking care of the family and other things. So which is very important, which probably we in the 12th world sometimes do not realize that, but it's very, very important for the 12th world countries. And we are trying to strengthen public-private partnership as far as this technology is concerned. Now I move on to another aspect of efficiency dialogue. Different people have different mindset or different thinking as far as efficiency is concerned. And efficiency can be measured by different ways. One of the most, okay, well, let me show you this one first. One of the units in the environmental dimension in the livestock sector is how much is the greenhouse gas produced per kg of milk or per kg of the body. Let me share you best. So how much of greenhouse is being produced for one kg of milk or, or, or muscle or whatever it is, protein. Here we have tried to have a common denominator per kg of protein because the moisture content is different. And if you convert greenhouse gas emission as kg CO2 equivalent per kg of protein, for beef it is 290 kg of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emission per kg of protein. Cattle milk 80. Small ruminant meat, 190. Uh, milk for small ruminants, 130. So if you look into this, these figures from the, from the uh, ruminant sector from 80 to 290. And if you look into pork, chicken meat, eggs, 20 to 50. So lower the number, more efficient as far as this unit is concerned. So if you just look at this graph, you would say that monocastric is highly efficient when we take this as the efficiency unit because we produce very less amount of or lesser amount of greenhouse gas per kg of protein as the ruminants. Now let's look at another dimension of the efficiency. And if we express efficiency as human edible protein output, means in animal products, divided by human edible protein input which is in the feed. So if we take this as the efficiency unit, this is, this is the average value of uh, some Asian countries. Cattle and buffalo 15. It means 15 times more human edible protein is being produced by cattle and buffalo production systems as compared to what we add into the feed. So one unit into the feed, 15 units output. So it means this is the uh, higher the number, better it is. For sheep, goat, it's 25, 24 units extra than what you add into the feed as human protein, human edible protein. Poultry, 0.8. It means it's draining the system as well as protein. You are adding more protein into the human edible protein, into the diet and getting less. Although you would argue that protein quality is better of the animal protein, certainly. Uh, we, we should agree that, yeah. 
if you compare the protein quality of the animal products and plant products, definitely the quality is better. But if you, look, if you don't take that in quality into consideration as absolute amount is draining the system. Pigs two, ducks three, aquaculture reasonably good, very good, I would say. And and uh, this is uh, village poultry because village poultry goes around and then picks up all the insects and other things, and there's very little in when they accumulate protein into that. So if you take this as unit of efficiency, then you would say that the mono the monogastrics are less efficient as compared to ruminants because. These can be maintained on grasses and industrial byproducts and, and less of humanity things which are cereals. So if, if you consider this as, as the efficiency unit, then the ruminants are much better in this expression. This is the study done by FAO where we looked into uh, how human animal protein is produced by different countries at an aggregated level. It's all production. We did not segregate to, pro, to ruminants or, or monogastics. So, if you whole production system, all USA 0.53, it was one unit of human animal protein going into the animal sector, into the field, and getting only 0.5 units out of that for human consumption. Saudi Arabia, everything is imported, all cereal based, very little grass, very little agroindustrial byproducts. Point nine. Germany also in negative. Now look at Mongolia. Mongolia is all the production system is based on glass. 14.6. New Zealand also very good because there are also milk production is based on glasses, glass like this system. India, mainly crop residues and, and, and agro-industrial byproducts, 4.3. So if the number is greater than one, it means it is a net contributor to food security. And if the number is less than one, it means you are producing more to the livestock sector and getting less of human animal protein. This compares small order production system and intensive production. Earlier we have been looking ruminant versus bone gas. Now we are, we are trying to compare small water dairy farms and intensive dairy farms. In terms of emission intensity, kg of greenhouse gas produced as CO2 equivalent per kg of milk at the farm gate level. Small water dairy farms in India and Kenya, two to three. Two to three kg of greenhouse gas emitted at CO2 equivalent per kg of milk. But in intensive production is much lower, half of that. So you would say that industrial production system, when we take this as the unit of efficiency, are much more efficient because they produce half of the greenhouse gas emission okay, as compared to the small production systems. But now if you look into human edible protein output to human edible protein input, Indian milk system 10.9, so only one unit of human edible protein to feed 10.9 unit output. Jordan. 0.6, USA 1.81, UK 1.41. So if we compare this number with this one, you would say that small water production systems are much more efficient when we take this as. <coughs> but with emission intensity, they are poor. So it depends. The conclusion would depend what units you would take to explain efficiency. Now there's a strong move. Fortunately, or I would say unfortunately, being from the Urban Board, that in five, seven years' time in Europe, milk or animal products will be labeled so that the customer could see with the emission intensity how much greenhouse gas is being produced per kg of milk which you are buying from the supermarket. So this would come out. I think the move is there in five, seven years, at least in Europe. This is a paper in Nature Climate. November 2016, suggesting tax on beef 40%, milk 20% to cut carbon. If this thinking moves on, certainly the developing countries will be at disadvantage because they are producing milk from uh, crop residues, byproducts which we don't consume, but of course they produce a more of greenhouse gas. But from the food security point of view, they are much better than these systems intensive ones. So this is 
where the world, at least EU is thinking is moving. But I think there's a need for the industries to not only look at the emission intensity is very important. One should measure it because ultimately the aim has to be to reduce emission intensity so that you produce more milk with less CO2 emission. But this should not be only the measure of efficiency. Otherwise, it could be misleading. If you get a milk from the market with labeled as only emission intensity, customers would tend to buy one which has got lower emission intensity. But behind that. There are many other efficiency dimensions which are hidden. Nobody knows. The human edible protein, and, and I would show on the next slide, there are other dimensions of efficiency which are hidden, which nobody knows. The customer just knows emission intensity and makes the decision to buy or not to buy based on emission intensity, which, in my opinion, is not right. Efficiency, as I said, is important, but it's not the only thing. Okay, then let me. How much is water use per kg of milk produced? There's a different land use change and disruption of global nitrogen cycle. In order to produce milk in Europe, 70 percent of the protein is coming from Latin America, completely disrupting the nitrogen cycle. Mining nitrogen from Latin America, concentrating in, in Europe, is it sustainable? Although greenhouse gas emission per kg is low, but at a global level, this system is creating a lot of disruption in the nitrogen cycle. It's hidden. If only the customers see emission intensity, all these things would not be represented correctly. And these are other dimensions of efficiency in the social areas. Very important for developing countries, might not be important for the, for the developed world. Milk production in developing country. It uplifts the farmers out of poverty. Families lifted out of poverty part time of milk which they produce. How many additional children go to school because they produce milk? Women empowerment. Employment generated. Improvement in child health. So these are the social dimensions which are linked to animal industry, animal products, milk production, meat production. So these are another dimensions in the social areas which need to be captured. And to represent correctly, we have to come up with not only one dimension of efficiency, which is literature is full of emission in greenhouse gas emission per kg of milk per week. But there are other dimensions which we need to capture, which also is very important for at least to be more. Okay, I will skip this one. Feet and environment. In fact, feed is the driver of the whole livestock production system. And if we look into the greenhouse gas emission of the livestock production system 40, at a global level, 45% of the greenhouse gas is emitted during feed production and processing. 39% of the greenhouse gas is entirely manure management. And if you add it up, around 80 to 90% of the greenhouse gas emission is linked to feed production and use. So feed is a very important component when we talk about sustainability in the environment action. If we could increase the feed use efficiency, it is a win-win situation both for the environment and for the farmer because it decreases the feed cost. Even if it does not increase the production, if it decreases the feed cost, there is a net increase in the income of the farmers. And at the same time, we reduce the greenhouse gas emission. So what we say is that all analysis go towards that if you could manage feed correctly, then you could increase the profit of the farmers as well as increase the greenhouse gas emission. Again, as I said, feed is the driver. It impacts almost all sectors and services of the production, product quality, animal welfare, animal health, feed food, you name it and everything, and economic viability. Because 70% of the cost of production is feed. And if it decrease by 5 to 10 percent, that increase without adversely affecting the productivity, that increases the net profit to the farmer and also decreases greenhouse gas emission. Yes, feed is important, but equally important, especially in the developing countries, is parasitic control, crop management, heifer management. These are all various inefficiencies which are in the uh, production systems in the developing world. That is why the emission intensity is very high. So if you could manage these, and this is not rocket science, science is there. Only thing is application is how we apply 
at the farmers level, which are small scale farmers, not highly skilled, having two to five animals per family. <coughs> How to apply science in their doorstep is a big challenge. It's not the science, science is there, but the application is, is a big challenge. This is what uh, an average family in US consumes per week, and this is the situation in the sub-Saharan Africa. So, previous slide, I will start getting more on increase in productivity. Now, now let's, let's briefly look at the consumption side. Can we increase the sustainability of the food production system through the consumption side? Of course, we have to increase productivity, increase the efficiency, but let's look at the production side, uh, consumption size. U.S. Average protein consumption per day in the U.S. is 120 gram per person per day, and more than 50 percent is coming from animal products. Burundi in Africa, 1.7 gram out of total 42.5. Very low animal protein consumption. And if you look into the literature, first there are two things. One is that According to WHO, uh, um, uh, the protein requirement per day is for healthy living one on the maximum side. It is in fact 0.88 to 1 gram per kg body weight per day. So if you have, if you have 60 kg body weight, you are consuming 60 gram of protein less enough for healthy living. And, uh, and the literature suggests that if one, if one third of that comes from animal protein, one can lead a healthy life without any apparent adverse effects. So if out of 60 gram as an adult, 20 gram is coming from animal protein for healthy living. And if one is consuming 69 gram and another country 1.7 gram only, I think what we would recommend is that you try to converge to 20 gram. Those who are eating a lot should decrease it and those who are not eating much should increase. So this is another equation which we have to think and change the mindset. And it's a question of sustainability and also it's a question of human of our own health if we eat too much. So it means coming, converting to 20 gram of protein per day per person. And what I did was I just looked at the protein production global how much protein is being produced by all the livestock production system in the world divided by 7.2 billion people. It comes that without fish, 24 gram of protein we are producing at global level per day per person. And if we go by science and says we need only 20 gram, it means we are producing sufficient currently. It's a question of distribution, affordability. It's available a very high level in the world, but very low. It's a question of distribution, transport, affordability is another issue. Even if you provide animal products, people don't have money to buy that. So this is quite complex, but if you look into the overall picture, we are currently producing sufficient protein for healthy living. Only thing is that some people are eating too much and some people are not. And it's quite complex. And if you go by this equation, we would need by 2050 only 30 to 35 percent more of animal products. It's just based on population because the population would increase by 30 to 35 percent. So we need more. If you go by uh, science, uh, but if you go with the pattern as is going on, the projections are that you would need around 70 percent more of animal products by 2050 with the same pattern. I think uh, I would leave some time for questions. And I would skip this study and just give you a flavor of that. In this study, what we did was we looked at, let's try to understand a scenario that all the livestock production system, even monogastic, are being fed on those feed resources which we do not consume. Grasses, agroindustrial, even monogastics. Uh, grasses, agroindustrial byproducts. This is the scenario. And what is the conclusion then? Conclusion is that, of course, the cattle ruminant number would increase. Monogastic would decrease. Of course, there will not be much serious. And then the scenario would, would come out that the monogastic 
number would decrease. Coat number ruminant would increase. Environment less of methane emission. Uh, land arable land would decrease. Nitrogen surplus would decrease from current level phosphorus emission would decrease. So environmentally there would be a lot of benefits. But the diet would change. Currently, almost 34 percent of the protein is being coming from uh, uh, being coming from animal proteins. But in that scenario, only 11 percent will come from animal. So that's will come from plant protein. So this is a scenario, and it doesn't mean that one has to follow that. But this could be considered one of options in the basket of many options if, <coughs> if, we, if, we, if we try to look into the future. I know it is not possible just to have whole livestock production system, including monogastics, exclusively on those three resources we, we do not know. But can we think as a researcher that slowly and slowly we will come up with those through R&D, those three resources which do not compete with human food, but can we still be very good feed? As for the cereal, why not we start doing research in that direction that we slowly and slowly try to reduce grain uh, cereals into, into the livestock system. So there are some take, take home messages. So several human inedible resources are available <coughs> and in future to R&D there will be more and more and we need to, to research on that and, and, and explore it. Opportunities exert, uh, exist to convert food waste and loss to animal feed. There are very good examples and we should learn from Japan and South Korea. We need to think efficiency in multi multi dimensions, not only emission intensity, but looking sustainability as a as a as a policy component. And sustainability is a big issue. I'm not going to go in that direction, but it has three pillar of, uh, of people, planet, and profit. Everything has to be in the matrix to address that. Improving efficiency of animal production is very important, need, especially in the developing world. The systems are inefficient and science is there to increase efficiency. The challenge is to implement those. Challenges to distribution is an issue. Available in large quantity in the developed world, but not in. And use, you can use the affordability. The affordability of the developing world is not there, especially in Africa. To, even if you provide, they will not be able to buy that. So these are some of the issues towards sustainable food production. And of course, as a researcher, research and innovations toward use of human inedible feed without compromising animal production. That is the key. As a scientist, if you could come up with field resources which do not compete with human food but do not compromise the productivity, I think that is the way to go for future sustainable food systems. Last slide, I leave you with this note. Only sound science can lead to sound policy. And I think the role of you people as scientists, universities, institutions is very important in this process. So thank you very much. Well, my main question is about <coughs> the population, as you say, world population. And, and then about Sobin and Moring, Moringa. Moringa. So I read an article recently in Science. It says China, in 1995, imported 75 million tons of soybean between 2013 or 14, they imported $38 billion of survey. But in 2014, they need the production of survey in USA, Brazil, Argentina, Combat. Then, how about the rest of the world? That will be a big issue because, uh, and, and I think the livestock industry is worried about it. That's a China would, uh, currently, China. Uh, imports 70 percent of the traded feed. Only 30 percent are left from the world. So 70 percent, whatever is in the market, is, is taken away by China, and that will be a big driver as far as cost is concerned, trade is concerned. It, it's a big issue. Definitely, China would would be a big driver, and uh, uh, I don't have any solution how to how to balance that equation. It's connected to my next question. The the health of the world, 
what you say in the song, a lot of us we don't believe uh, climate change. How are the United Nations going to lecture us? Means every country, are we going to listen to United Nations live? We need to be smart now. Sure, sure. One thing is that well, I need to clarify to you is that FTO just puts some recommendations to the member states. FTO has 170 in member states. FTO would not impose its own thinking on any country. It cannot. It cannot. So all our reports put the science and as they analyze it, of course, taking help of you people as well. Most of the documents which are being written by FTO uh, if your staff uh, play a catalytic role, but the knowledge comes from all you people. You put that together, analyze it, and then come up with a conclusion which we put before the uh, countries. And this is what the analysis says, and now it's up to you to decide. If you is not going, any UN organization would not uh, advise, but would not say that you do it like that. No, I understand that. And very nice presentation, I like it, I enjoy this type of talk. And how about the work in 2050, yeah. for everybody, I'm talking about agriculture and human, we need 50% increased fresh water. Yeah. Well, we yeah. no, that, that's another, well, we, we have a separate, separate institution for water, but FU is also now well aware of that, that issue. And, but, uh, so far, FU has not uh, looked into this area very critically. Now, various analysis are starting. Now, water footprint, the methodology, how to, how to calculate water footprint of animal products. And if you look into the literature, somebody is using another methodology, another is using another methodology. So what FU has done is last year, they invited export in the area of water one table and said, okay, discuss it and come up with one methodology, which can be used for everybody. But no methodology is perfect. There might be some deficiencies, but let's agree to one methodology so that we compare apple with apple. And can you imagine that group has not yet come up with consensus? And this was last year. First of all. I'm sorry about So you know, the methodologies are there, not there. But the FU has at least started thinking about it, that uh, it's a very big issue. Methodologies are not there. Methodologies are there, but there's no consensus. Let's try to bring all stakeholders together and agree on that, so that everybody is using that methodology. And then, of course, you your story. Interventions will appear once you have a sound methodology, how to take this over. Great. What's the FAO stance on like growth enhancing technologies for livestock production? So so which technologies? Growth enhancing technologies, oh. so anabolic implants, beta agonists, that would be one of the most efficient ways of producing more beef with the same resources. Yes. FAO has been very conservative in stating these things because there's a big opposition from many of the member states not to adopt that. But that's a trade issue, not a science issue, right? Uh, it, it becomes even a science issue as well sometime in FAO. So, and FU has been shying away from this because uh, they don't want to create any any controversy in, in their ground. Uh, they have tried to bring together all the people together to agree on that, but FU has not taken any stand on anything because FU feels still not comfortable in taking stands. FU doesn't have a very clear stand on biotechnology, especially in CM. Is it that a pretty low hanging fruit for talking about food security worldwide? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a political question as well, which probably I will not be able to answer. But it, it's if you look into the science as a scientist, you might have a different opinion. Yes. But uh, if you if you go to that platform where other people have a different, you have to respect them. And FU has to respect all all the opinions. And if they come to some consensus in, it, in their platform, they will mention that this is what export rating suggested. This is not FU what what is suggesting. So FU would be neutral. In that. We have to move on, so we need quick questions. And following the same thought that Joe was saying about increasing productivity, the genetic engineering now in the States is an easy tool for us to use. So, what do you think that could change on your predictions based on the genetic engineering that is available now? Yeah, 
we have not done that analysis. Most of our FAO analysis are based on the projections as the trends are going on, but they are a bit open that the trend might not go in that way. If the consumption decreases because of some reasons, uh, we will not pick 70% more per uh, higher uh, annual products, but probably need less of that. So these type of projections, how the GM would come out and to what extent it will be adoptable. Uh, it's, this is a bit of different uh, novel sort of thing. Still, that has not done any analysis how this will impact the global scenario as far as food production is concerned. We, I'm sorry.